Hello, good evening. So I get a lot of public talks, but this one I'm a little, uh, there's a lot of pieces to this story and I wasn't sure what to tell you, which parts to focus on. So at first I thought I would meander you through my own research process and then I realized that, that this was already a long talk. I'm going to do a little bit of that. This is probably ultimately going to be more like a story of what happened than a lot of analysis of what happened. We just don't have a lot of time. I have cringe, don't cringe, 40 slides for a talk. I'm trying to get in under 45, 50 minutes. Don't you hate it when people do that? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to cruise through. So I'm here tonight to talk about William Wallace McCormick and his murder on the Callis Worcester, Vermont border in December of 1878. How many people here have heard of the murder of William Wallace McCormick before tonight? Mr. David Book, okay, good, good. Some, some hands in the crowd. Okay, so on December 11th, 1878, probably about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, William Wallace McCormick was shot in the back of the shoulder, in the back of the head, and three times through his abdomen in the desolate remote woods on the Worcester Callis border. His murderer was Royal Carr of the Carr family and um, the motive for the murder was that Royal and his cousin Chester or Chet wanted access to Hattie. Hattie was William Wallace's young wife and so they took to Hattie and they thought that they could get access to her by killing William Wallace, who they called usually the Indian or the half-breed Indian. I got into this project. Initially, I meant to do a research on my own family here, and um, I got sidetracked on this murder story. But this is kind of how I ended up in the archives. I teach. It was in between semesters. Last May, I came in, and I wanted to look up this woman sitting here is um, my, one of my grandmothers, and this is probably Virgin's in 1927. And so that's sort of uh, how I got started. So that's one acknowledgement. And then I want to acknowledge all of these people up here, because even though I'm here for American Archives Month, this really isn't an in the archives project, ultimately. I have talked to so many people. I followed down so many dead ends that lead nowhere. I spend time on the internet cold contacting people with stories like your deceased stepfather had a uncle and that uncle had a grandmother and do you know anything about her? What do you think they say? My friend Tess Taylor joked at me and said, oh yeah, what did they say? Yes, I've got her DNA in the attic. I'll go get it for you. <laughs> that doesn't happen. But I want to... <laughs> Uh, first off, I want to thank especially Martha Hazard Small at the top of that list. She's a fantastic researcher and she has supplied me with so uh, many sources and so many interesting stories. And also uh, Chief Cheryl Tony Hawley and Dr. Ray Gould and Gary Hazard. And some of you may know Gary, he lived in Morrisville until he moved to Maine. Goes on, these are all people or institutions that have contacted to do this research including the folks here tonight, and especially um, Marisa, because she specializes in the court records. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to point out that there are all kinds of conversations going on about the archives right now, about whose stories get recorded in the archives, who has access to the archives, what that all means. There was a story by Ashley Farmer in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that got a lot of press about what it's like to be black in the archives and whether she as a researcher feels welcomed in the archives, whether her story is told in the archives, um, and this story kind of went viral. So that's one aspect of talking about archives. The American Historical Association similarly tweeting out about how archives might be a lonesome sort of endeavor, but really help to cement who we are as historians and the stories that we tell and what we know. Um, and then this may be a little on the snarkier side. It's harder to do projects that take you out of the archives. It's maybe easier to look at somebody's published biography and decide you're going to write a project about that person. Um, I also think about archives in terms of people like me who are sort of part-time educators, uh, adjuncts, 
who don't have institutional affiliations. And what happens right now, the quota is like, I think it's 80% across the nation of uh, higher ed instructors are adjuncts, only 20% have tenure. What happens in 20 years when 100% of us are adjuncts and nobody has the time, the resources, the inclination to come to places like this? It's going to be the archivists. I don't know what you guys are going to be doing. But, you know, um, so one guiding research question for this topic was who was Royal Carr? Who's this murderer? And what made him tick? These are some quotes from mostly Vermont newspapers. Ignorant brute, animal, animal predominates over the intellectual, an ugly customer, <laughs> ignorant stupid man. So basically, Royal Carr um, was mentally disabled. And he had some relatives who weren't probably very good influences on him, in particular his cousin Chester or Chet, and in talking to Marisa about sort of the criminal records here, you get a sense as you go through them that a lot of these people convicted of crimes had some sort of disability, like the deaf woman that Marisa told me about, who really was just trying to curry favor with people because she didn't have any social community. She was looking for some sort of social outlet, and she fell into kind of a bad crowd, and a crime resulted from that. I am not at all absolving Royal of his responsibility here, but he could not read, he could not write, he could not um, recount the days of the week, and he could not count to ten. So that's sort of the amount of, um, of <clears throat> dis excuse me, disability that we're dealing with when we talk about Royal Carr. Royal Carr had killed before. In the early 1860s, he held down a young married woman named Mary Loomis, while well, Mary Loomis's brother-in-law raped and strangled her. Mary Loomis, excuse me, was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. This happened on the Eagle Ledge Road. As David Book will tell you, all of the murders that ever happened in Callis have happened on the Eagle Ledge Road or just Worcester. off, I'm oh, sorry, Worcester, or just off of the Eagle Ledge Road. So there was no DNA testing at the time. The um, rapist and murderer uh, got off because he did not confess. Royal, being um, special needs, did confess. And so he was sent to Windsor for 10 years. He was let off one year early for good behavior, at which point he came back to Worcester, and he was living part-time with one cousin and part-time with the other cousin. He was living with Chester and then with cousin Ira, who lived right over the line in Callis. What about the victim, William Wallace McCormick? The Indian was a roving basket maker who eked out a living by fiddling inoffensive and industrious, an athletic vagabond of magnificent physique, more than six feet tall, broad-chested, and straight as an arrow. And you see that a lot in descriptions of William Wallace, that he was, in a word, you can't read about William Wallace without thinking that he was just gorgeous. Um, and people, mar you know, always commented on this, you know, he has this beautiful uh, build, he's six feet tall. This is a time period when most people are not anywhere near six feet tall. Um, so this is William Wallace. I call him William Wallace because in some accounts his name is, ref uh, they call him William. Sometimes they call him Wallace. A couple of times I've seen him referred to as just Will. But uh, I do think it, sometimes he did go by Wallace, and so I've taken to referring to him as William Wallace. Hattie Kenny was the young girl who accompanied William Wallace into Worcester. The Vermont watchman reported that besides the girl, he brought with him a hand cart containing his housekeeping utensils, a dog, a gun, and a fiddle. And what he would do is he would travel around and he would uh, fiddle in exchange for supper. He also sold baskets. And so that's kind of how he made his way in Callis and in Washington County, Vermont, up until the time of his murder. So at the time of his murder, he and Hattie were, according to the newspaper, um, kind of living in the abandoned schoolhouse in East Elmore. The way it reads in the paper uh, is that they were kind of 
squatting or that they were there. Um, the, way I, uh, the way I read it anyway initially was that they were sort of there without permission. Maybe it, it was in a remote area, this abandoned schoolhouse. Maybe people didn't know that they were there, but that I don't think is true at all. I think the people of East Elmore knew very well that Hattie and William Wallace were in the schoolhouse. I went out this summer and I found this schoolhouse. If you think this is the schoolhouse where they squatted, you would be wrong. I was wrong. The people who live here are very nice. Um, <laughs> oh, good. They're very nice. I went inside. They made me sign my name on their blackboard and ring the bell. So if you're looking for a fun thing to do, go down through the back room of the bar until you find this place and then go knock on the door. But totally the wrong schoolhouse. This is not where Hattie and William Wallace are staying. Not at all. Had electricity. Then I made friends with Cricket Smith, who is a wonderful town historian for Elmore. Every town needs a Cricket Smith. And Cricket Smith said, I know where that schoolhouse was. I will take you there. So, okay. So Cricket and I made a date. We went down into East Elmore. East Elmore today seems like the middle of nowhere. It did not used to um, be the middle of nowhere. It was a thriving community. There were a lot of sawmills down there that kind of petered out in the late 19th century when the trees were gone. There was a Methodist Episcopal church down there. There was a schoolhouse, lots of people. Um, and so this is, we went, this is down the road looking back up. This is one of the roads leading into East Elmore, which is still a road uh, it's used once in a while for logging operations. People mountain bike and ski out there. And it's so fun to go down there because you really get the sense of um, this 19th century road network. It's very interesting. In any case, so here's Cricket standing on the other side of the foundation of the schoolhouse. But if you think this is the schoolhouse where William Wallace and Hattie were staying, you would be wrong. This is not Another the radical. schoolhouse. This is, uh, yes, nothing about this research has been particularly easy. So if you look at this map, this is the 1878 East Elmore Beers map. The school is right here. We came down the road, we parked, we walked down. Um, you go down into here, into... Worcester. All right. Here's the earlier, about 20 years earlier, walling map of the same area. And Cricket told me, she said, you know, I think on the earlier map the school's in a different location. And I thought, oh, those old maps are not exact. What do they know? But she was absolutely right. Here's the school on the earlier map. So that's where William Wallace and Hattie would have been squatting in the winter of 1878. You see it's right on the Woodbury line. The cars all came out of Woodbury into Callis and Worcester. So this all makes sense. So the particulars of the murder, of what happened to William Wallace. This is a painting of Lucy Ainsworth Cook, a.k.a. Sleeping Lucy, for you Vermont history fans, uh, from Callis. She's the mesmerer. She, was the, she could find stuff. She could find your lost wallet. She went on to New York City. She went to New York City and had quite a career um, as a, a mesmerer. And she was born and raised in Callis. So I put her in here just um, for context because William Wallace and Hattie had been down to Chester Carr's house the week before William Wallace's murder. They were down there, the newspaper reported, because Chester wanted William Wallace to play the fiddle for a party, but he also wanted William Wallace and Hattie to help him find stolen property because he understood that they were clairvoyant. So that raises a question for you. Was that coming from William Wallace um, or was that coming from Hattie? Was that coming from both of them? Any of you who know dowsers know that that's also the sort of thing that dowsers do in a sort of European folk tradition as well. So I can't really answer that question for you where the idea of the clairvoyant um, uh, capabilities was coming from, but that's why they were at Chester's house. They then went back to the schoolhouse in, schoolhouse in East Elmore. Now right off of Eagle Ledge Road, today the road dead ends and you need to walk. But you could, um, at one point, travel the whole way. It's really not terribly far from that section of Worcester up into East Elmore. So they decided on the morning of December 11th that they wanted William Wallace and Hattie to come back down to their place. 
They wanted Hattie to do some sewing for them. As Cricket said to me as we were walking in the woods, what kind of sewing did they want her to do? Because they were dirt poor. Chester and his wife and kids were paupers um, to the town on one census record, and they had, they had nothing. Chester was reported to have a couple of what, was, what were called common law wives, different children. Um, the newspaper reports after the murder that, that while Royal was a murderer, a lot of the other cars were upstanding citizens. Um, I then, in the process of the research, found some of the car descendants, and it's not quite as rosy as that. A lot of the cars had trouble with the law, um, criminal records, but in any case, they went out. So I assume that they went down to do uh, basic, she was asked to come down to do basic sewing. It's really clear in the newspaper reports that Hattie did not want to go to Chester Carr's house. I mean, you think about it in the context of the Me Too movement and everything we're talking about right now. Hattie didn't want to be anywhere near Chester and his wife. And she said to them, I will only go if William Wallace comes with me. So William Wallace finally agreed to go. So Hattie gets in the wagon with Chester, his wife, and a toddler child. And William Wallace goes, makes his way through the woods and is going to meet up at Chester's house. He said he was going to hunt. If you know anything about hunting in Washington County at this time, you know that there were no large game animals at all. Actually, my very first historical project I did as a master's degree student was over in Callis, coincidentally. And um, one fact that came out of that research is that people at this time were like squirrel hunting. There was really not that much that they were going to find in the woods. But in any case, William Wallace says he'll walk his way down to Chester's house from the schoolhouse in East Elmore and hunt as he goes. They all arrive by dinner time on Wednesday, December 11th, which is to say lunch. Right here, so East Elmore is up here. Here's the schoolhouse at the fork of the road. Today, if you come um, through Worcester Village and you go past the Doty School and you come out this way, you come up Eagle Ledge Road. This uh, pond is still here, just like this. There was a sawmill here. And then there's a fork in the road with a schoolhouse right there. And off of this branch of the fork, if you go up, it says M-A and I-R car. Now, I asked David Book, the Worcester Town historian, um, you know, everybody needs a cricket above the border in East Callis, and everybody needs a David in Worcester. I sent David an email with this, this map, and I said, David, I've been up Eagle Ledge Road twice, and my car goes as far as that old white schoolhouse up there, and I see the sign that beyond that is a town trail, and I need a permit, but where the heck is this fork? Because it's after the pond. Luckily, the pond is still there as, as a marker for me. And David not only replied, but when he replied, he had walked the whole thing for me. And he said, well, I walked out there. And what is it, David, like a mile and a half past where his cars can drive today, up that fork? It's a little less than that, but it's been, when you get to the fork, it's 1.8 miles up, up Shepherd, what's called Shepherd Hill. Okay. So you did a lot of hiking. Yes, <laughs> And And, and um, you said that this fork, which runs up into Elmore, is parts of it are impassable That's now, right. swampy? Correct. Okay. So I haven't been out there yet, but so it bothered me for, it bothered me because this is Martha and Ira Carr. That would be their house. And it's Ira's house that they're headed to when William Wallace is murdered. So Hattie and William Wallace arrive separately for dinner time on Wednesday, December 11th. After dinner is over, Royal says, hey, William Wallace, why don't we walk over to Cousin Ira's house? When we get there, we can hunt on the way, and when we get there, he'll have cider and apples for us, and we'll have a good time. It's also clear in the record that William Wallace didn't want to go. I think he was worried about Hattie. I think he probably had a bad vibe about all of these cars. He didn't want to go, but in any case, he relents and he agrees to go. So Royal and William Wallace and William Wallace's dog start off from Chester's house, making their way through the woods to cousin Ira's house. They never make it because William Wallace is murdered. Royal does make it. Another bit of the story is that dog. I'm a big dog person, and I would love to know the name of that dog. Oh, and there's no name for the dog anywhere in any of the records. So, 
spoiler alert, what I finally figured out is that this is the residence where Chester and his wife and toddler, at least one child, maybe more, are staying. I'm pretty sure about that. So William Wallace and Hattie are coming this way, and they're having dinner on Wednesday, December 11th in this residence here. And this makes sense because that would be, here's the pond on a different map, so this would be up here somewhere. And they cross the line into Callis, and uh, William Wallace is shot right at Eagle Ledge, right near Hawkins Pond. It's called Hawkins Ledge or Hawkins Pond. And on a different map, this road right here, it's either this property or it comes out a little bit a couple of years later. Um, it's a typo. It says Kerr, but it says I Kerr. So Ira Carr lives there. His brother is over here in a house that he probably owns, because I don't think Chester had the finances to own a house. Okay, so this is where William Wallace is murdered in the woods. Even at the time, people said this was remote, middle of nowhere. We think about the 19th century in Vermont, and we think about deforestation, and we think, well, it wasn't as woodsy and remote, certainly then, as it was now, but it was. And in the newspaper reports of the murder, people said this is so remote that before the murder, a lot of the old-timers had never even been out there. Nobody goes out there. If you do Google Maps today, unfortunately the Google Map is from summer and there's a lot of foliage, but it's just unbroken. Although, um, Marge Garfield, another wonderful assistant on this project, who's associated with the Callistown Town Clerk's Office and the Vermont Historical Society, Marge tells me that Hawkins Ledge isn't really that remote if you go from the Callis end. I don't know if that's true or not. I want to find out, but I want to go out there uh, when there's snow on the ground. Huh. Because there was snow on the ground when William Wallace was killed. So one question I asked David when I first connected with him is, do you know anybody who can take me to the murder site? <laughs> and David did find somebody, and I've now gathered up a short list of people who want to go with me, but I really want, I really want to go when there's about four or five inches of snow on the ground because it had been snowing that day, and um, so they get here, and I told you how many times William Wallace was shot. Yeah. Royal makes his way to Cousin Ira's house and proceeds to clean his gun, and he says to Cousin Ira, geez, if two men went into the woods and only one man came out, what would happen to the man who came out? And Cousin Ira says, well, he probably would have some answering to do. So Cousin Royal cleans his gun and puts it away, this is Wednesday night. Hattie, meanwhile, is still over at Chester's, completely frantic because she knows. When it's nightfall and William Wallace doesn't come home, she knows. So Thursday morning, Royal wakes up at Ira's house. He makes his way sometime mid-morning probably back to the murder site where he covers William Wallace's body with um, some, some boughs and things, and he shoots the dog. No. which means he left the dog all night. Yeah, he shoots the dog, and he covers the dog's body as well. And then he makes his way back to Chester's. And he goes into the house, and Hattie's crying, and she's frantic. And Royal says, what, he didn't come back? He went with me a little bit into the woods, but then we parted ways, and he said he was going to go hunt on his own hook, and I never saw him again. So Hattie doesn't believe this. She leaves, and she tries to go finds the bodies. She gets close, the newspaper says, but gets lost. It's apparently very remote. She can't access it, and she's not quite sure where she's going. So she goes back. Um, Chester, there's confliction here. Royal then talks to Chester, and he kind of tells him, more or less, and not, not so many words, what he did. And Hattie is becoming increasingly frantic. And depending on your read of it, the, I guess the, the flattering read towards Cousin Chester is that he went to the authorities because Royal told him what he had done and that was the right thing to do. The unflattering read of Chester is that Chester instigated this whole thing and encouraged Royal to do this, which is my read of this, encouraged Royal to do this and then realized that it just wasn't going to work. They weren't going to get away with this. Best to frame it on Royal, who's already been to Windsor for nine years for um, that first murder. So the authorities get involved. They find the bodies, of, the body of, of William Wallace and the body of his dog, later in the day on, on Friday. 
and they can see because it had snowed and it had been really warm the day they went out there and then it got cold and it froze. They can see clearly the footprints of, the, of William Wallace and Royal going into the woods. They can see where William Wallace was killed and then they see where Royal's single tracks go out of the woods. They can see where Royal comes back the next day, where he kills the dog, covers the dog's body, and makes his way back to Chester's. When um, an entourage of Callis and Worcester men go into the woods to find the body, they take Royal's boot with them because his boot had unique <coughs> patches and wrinkles on the sole. And because of the frozen tread, it perfectly matches, and they can see where Royal was walking. So they arrest Royal. He's held by the, he's arrested by the, the constable. He's held in a local guy's kitchen. And this becomes a big factor in the trial because um, the lawyers are trying to figure out exactly what that guy said to Royal in the kitchen. And it seems like he sort of said, if you frame it on Chester, things are going to be better for you. And so it's a problem in the trial. Okay. so. What happened to William Wallace's body? This was another question I asked David. I think I asked him two questions the first time. Who can take me to the murder scene and what happened to the body? And so this, again, was not an easy question to answer. because I, I wasn't was alive then. Yet. <laughs> 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 All right, so what happened to William Wallace's body? Well, through Marge Garfield over in Callis, she reminded me of West Cape's history of Callis, where he cites this murder in a paragraph, and he said he lists the charges. The town of Callis paid for a burial robe, a casket, a hearse, horse and wagon, um, and a burial plot over in Worcester. Now, people in Worcester were buried for free in their town cemetery, but since R William Wallace was killed in Callis, Callis picks up the charges. Callis pays $3.50 for a burial plot in the Worcester Cemetery. Now, the one easy thing about this research is that the town of Worcester has only ever had that one cemetery right there on Route 12. Uh, so it's... One. Well, are you going to dispute that? Good, good. I mean, it makes it easy. You don't yeah. have to go it, you know, up into the woods and find the old stones. So um, I worked with the Worcester Cemetery Commissioner, and we, we couldn't quite figure it out. And then I called Paul White, the former Worcester Cemetery Commissioner. And Paul said, go into the cemetery in the back corner where the ground sinks down, and there are about seven bodies back there, and we don't know who they are. Hmm. So this uh, is right here. This is where the ground sinks down um, on the Elmore side of the cemetery. So my methodology for this research really clearly had taken me out of the archives, into these communities, into the environment. And one trend that's going on in Native American history right now is environmental um, histories of Native American experiences. And you, 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 know, you can't really study William Wallace without moving out into the woods. Um, I also talked to him a lot. So here I was in the cemetery by myself. And, you know, hi, William Wallace. I'm really sorry about what happened to you. So I don't know for certain that that's where he's buried, but it seems like the best guess. Okay, so here's the mystery part of the research. So William Wallace's murder goes through the Vermont court system under the name <coughs> William Wallace McCormick. McCormick is spelled in several different ways. I've picked just one on this slide, probably um, the most popular spelling, goes through the court, it goes through, it goes through um, a legislative process after that where um, they ask for a pardon from the legislature, they ask the governor to, to commute the sentence, and none of those things worked. And so on the last Friday in April of 1881, Royal Carr was executed, hanged by the neck in the yard of the Windsor prison. So that's what happened to Royal. Um, when I started this research, I said, Mercomic, I'm not quite sure what kind of name that is. Marisa suggested to me, she was helping me tremendously, she suggested we thought it might be just a misspelling of McCormick. 
And after all, the newspaper did describe William Wallace as a half-breed Indian, which gets into all this sort of 19th century racial ideas about blood quantum, which people don't uh, talk about anymore. And I don't have a lot of time tonight to go over that. But they also say several times that he was of Scot Scottish descent, Scottish descent. And so I was thinking kind of of. Um,